Well, I guess this is, as they say, the end of the road. Um, I've followed Colville's trail um, to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Bergen, um, Germany, just about 20 minutes north of the town of Sell and about an hour south of Hamburg. Um, I don't know what I was thinking uh, completely before I came to this place. Obviously, knowing that I was coming to the Belsen, the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp was uh, something, you know, extremely emotional. It's It's been an emotional couple of weeks, uh, you know, really on this trip and, and traveling through Yorkshire and the south of France and then Holland as well, too. Um, and uh, so I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to feel when I arrived here. Um, <clears throat> Taking the train into Germany was an interesting thing. Obviously, I've spent the last uh, couple of weeks talking about how um, how Germany was the enemy in a sense, you know, and and I think Germany today is is a wonderful country and you know wonderful people and uh, uh, very uh, fairly peaceful people as well too. But uh, at the same time, kind of hearing the German language and seeing the German signs after all of that um, discussion uh, was an interesting was an interesting feeling, but. Uh, so I came today, this morning, over to, to the um, the concentration camp. It was about a uh, seven-minute bike ride from the hotel that I'm staying in. And uh, I have had the opportunity to meet some wonderful researchers here as well, too. Um, Klaus Tatzler uh, and Thomas Rohr uh, were also here to kind of help me out and show me around. It kind of made me feel very welcome. The camp itself, there's there's not really much around. I think if you go to Auschwitz, um, and certainly when we went to Terezin, uh, there was much more to see. Um, Auschwitz has a lot more of the original barracks and a lot more of the original things to see there. But Bergen-Belsen was actually um, burned by the British uh, uh, about two months after it was liberated on April 15th uh, in 1944. There was a lot of worry about disease and... Um, I think there was an eager desire to kind of like put this behind people as well too, which of course doesn't work. And I think the British actually got some flack for destroying some of the evidence as well too. So uh, <clears throat> what we have here right now is almost, you know, what you would imagine a beautiful park to walk around. I'll just do a little pan. Um, <clears throat> so you can see, I've kind of taken some refuge under this little tree. This is a heath, this is uh, Lunenburg Heath. And so, uh, like you find on a lot of heath, there's this beautiful, uh, I'm not sure if it's lavender or if it's heather exactly. Uh, I think of heather when I talk about, think about heaths, but it's, uh, you know, absolutely gorgeous. Um, <clears throat> there, are have, there are a few kind of ruins around, a few kind of basements of things that you can find. There was a, um, a, a water reservoir that was built that you can still completely see, and there's some kind of really... Um, Devastating photos, of course, of, of people just after the liberation trying to get water from that fetid kind of uh, water reserve because there was nothing else. Um, I've learned you know, a lot kind of being here as well, too. Obviously, this was a concentration camp where a lot of uh, Jews and, um, and uh, uh, Roma and uh, homosexuals were brought as well, kind of from all over the, all over the place, but a lot obviously from um, Western Europe and from Holland and France. Uh, but also before that, so from 1941 to 43, it was also a big Russian um, prisoner of war camp. And something like 200,000 Russian soldiers were brought here, and of course most of them died. Um, and they were kind of in the, in the woods just over, uh, over there. Uh, the, the prisoner of war camp was kept separate from the, uh, from the concentration camp. Um, but uh, in 1943, the SS kind of took over the camp, uh, and it became more of what we think of when we think of it like kind of a traditional, um, like a concentration camp. Um, and Frank, of course, uh, died here, and her sister Margot. Um, it was in March of 1944. Anne and Margot were actually sent to Auschwitz um, after a little bit of time at the Westbork um, prison in Holland. And they were sent to Auschwitz and uh, eventually then from Auschwitz were brought back here uh, to Bergen-Belsen. And um, Anne died uh, of typhus uh, in March of 1944, so just two months before the camp was liberated. Um, about 52,000 actually, uh, so over 50,000 people died uh, in this camp. And it, although it wasn't specifically a death camp like Auschwitz was, uh, 
basically the people here were left left to die. So it was it was death through starvation and through hunger, uh, through um, the freezing cold uh, and, and disease, typhoid and typhus as well too. So um, Anne and Margot both died around the same time in March, uh, just two months before the liberation on April 15th. And also um, a lot of people died, uh, you know, I think another 14,000 people died here in the camp after the liberation happened as uh, people were so sick. And so the British, when the British came, they tried to do everything they could. Uh, just over the way, over um, over in that direction, is a, uh, it's a, it's currently a German um training base for the army. It was a training base for the British for a long time, but back at the time of the, um, of the concentration camp here, it was a Wehrmacht um, training ground. So it was a Nazi army training ground. Um, and uh, so that was basically when the liberation happened and they, the Nazis gave the British uh, safe passage to come in here and take over the camp. Uh, they took over the the base as well too, and so the hospital up there was used as a as a place to try to slowly bring people out of Bergen Belsen over the course of a few um, of several weeks uh, to try to gradually bring back people back to health. Because obviously, when you when you have hardly eaten for years, um, you had to be very careful about what you eat. So a lot of people just died because they weren't able to take in the nu nutrients and then and process um, the food that they needed. Uh, and so you know, even after the camp. Um, uh, it was uh, liberated, a lot of people still died. Um, the images of Bergen-Belsen, the films and the photographs that were taken were kind of one of the big eye-openers to well, Western countries and to American and Canadian countries um, in the Second World War, because I think before this people really didn't have a concept of what concentration camps were and what um, Nazi Germany was attempting with their with their um, final, um, final plan. Um, and so, uh, as it came closer to liberation, and as the British came closer to here, uh, the Germans tried to destroy all evidence that they had um, of the camp, and so they burned a lot. And there was a crematorium working to try to burn bodies, but it just wasn't working fast enough. So, in fact, um, uh, they started digging, you know, mass graves that they would just throw the bodies in. And, in fact, the reason that I decided to kind of come right here is that if you just look over right there... Um, that's the barrier there of one of these uh, mass graves. And if you've, again, seen the horrible videos, uh, film that was taken at the Liberation, um, you've probably seen the, 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 the pits with the bodies being rolled into them. And in fact, I, I got a sneaking suspicion just based on geography that this corner right here may have been where Colville was when he painted this painting uh, that you'll see right now. Um, and so, uh, you know, because of the because of the situation with um, because of the situation with una being unable to deal with the bodies, when the British came into the camp, there was about ten thousand bodies just lying on the ground, uh, ten thousand naked bodies that had been some had just been left in place, some had been piled up around the corners, but uh, they uh, their clothes had all been taken, obviously because the the people the prisoners here needed those to keep warm, um, but. It was an unimaginable sight of horror and something that you'd picture from, uh, you know, a Renaissance painting of hell. Uh, so it's it's kind of hard. It's hard to imagine, you know, what, what that would have been. Um, and I'm here 75 years kind of later after Colville interpreting his work, uh, interpreting um, the reality of what went on, on there. Um, and I think it's going to take a long time probably for me to process. Um, Colville wrote some interesting things at that time, and I just, I've got uh, down here um, my, my guidebook here. Oh, and, and there's, here's a picture as well, too, um, that he had created at that time. And one of the interesting things that he really says is, uh, is this. Um, this being in Belson was strange. As I've said to a number of people, the thing one felt was one felt badly that one didn't feel worse. That is to say, you see one dead person and it's too bad, but seeing 500 is not 500 times worse. There's a certain point at which you begin to feel nothing. I remember that soon after we got there, we put up our two little tents and we made supper. We cooked these canned food things on our little gas stove. You realize that you are still hungry. Nothing, obviously, compared to the people that were around them. It was a profoundly affecting experience. Obviously, it would be unless a person was an absolute fool. You were bound to think about this quite a bit. 
And I think, um, I think Colville did think about it quite a bit, and I'll, I think a lot of his later works uh, were influenced by that as well. Um, he doesn't draw faces a lot. A lot of time, there's a there's a strange kind of emotional detachment uh, uh, in his work, and, and yet the work is so emotional at the same time. Uh, and I can't help but think that that was was influenced, you know, by what happened here. Um, this is going to be obviously the the, the last movement of uh, my orchestral piece. And I think um, I think it's going to take a long time to process exactly um, how that comes out as well too. Uh, but I've you know I've been so fortunate to have this opportunity to follow um, this trail, try to get a little sense of of what's gone on. Um, I will check in again before uh, I get back to Canada. But uh, this will be probably you know one of the last uh, videos of this trip, um, as it kind of is the um, as I mentioned at the beginning the end of the road. Um, just the beginning of my road with this project and, and, and trying to find a, um, a true and an honest way to represent uh, everything I've seen here, uh, but, uh, but the end of the road for, um, for this trip. So we'll talk to you soon.